Hello and welcome to our next talk. Our speaker is this Ferg Unicorn. She's a web developer and also runs infrastructure. And she will tell us what to do when your personal infrastructure isn't quite enterprise enough and how to change that with Kubernetes. And warm welcome to this Ferg Unicorn. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me correctly. Uh, it would probably be best if we could see my slides. Didn't I connect the cable correctly or? Ah, perfect. <laughs> so yeah, slides. That's a good uh, thing to see. All right, yes, I'm going to uh, tell you about running personal infrastructure on Kubernetes. Um, uh, how to do it, if it's a good idea, why would one even have that idea. And yeah, let's get started. So first of all, here's my infrastructure. I guess that explains everything. Um, do I even have to hold the talk anymore? Like, um, obviously, no, that does not explain anything. Um, the graph is actually still missing some connections, but while it is um, unclear on purpose, it would have been even more unclear. I just wanted to poke fun at these startup websites that just throw a bunch of logos at you and yeah. So yeah, first of all, agenda. Uh, what? Part one. So first of all, what is Kubernetes? Uh, why? Why would you do this? Then how would you do this? Then what? Part two, where I will be going to um, explain my stack a bit. Um, difficulties that I encountered, uh, lessons learned, and at the end, should I do this? So what? Part one. What is Kubernetes? So it's a tool for container orchestration. What the hell does that mean? Um, so basically, it just chains to together a bunch of uh, very specialized software to distribute workloads across multiple servers. Enterprise uh, software developed by Google internal, but open source um, for their infrastructure. So yeah, it runs Google, so as enterprise as you can get. It's also very good for your CV. And maybe it's the future. Some people are definitely going to be telling you that it is. I'm not an enterprise, as you could probably tell. So why would I do that? Well, for the memes, of course. Um, no, seriously. Uh, the community, and in part their memes, because like I was following a couple of people because I liked them, and they kept posting like Kubernetes adjacent memes, and I wanted to understand those. So it's a bit for the memes. It's also a great learning experience. Like some people might say upskilling, so you could find better jobs, but I just enjoy learning stuff. Curiosity, like what are those enterprises doing internally that is not Java code? because I'm not going there. <laughs> um, my old infrastructure was already running on containers, so it was pretty easy. And maybe a bit system stability, like now I've got three servers instead of one, <laughs> but that's not too important to me. <laughs> How did I do this? Um, basically, I developed my infrastructure in four phases. In the first phase, I had a local minikube installed on my laptop um, to just see the viability, test out stuff, a weekend or two uh, of time was it that I used that. Then I switched on to local VMs, which was about a month's worth of weekends. And then I deployed to production, which was uh, only a couple of hours of time. It was dangerous since, um, yeah, it was not a zero downtime deployment. I killed my old server before I um, deployed my Kubernetes cluster. And then we've got also ongoing maintenance ever since I set up this cluster. So phase one, local minikube. First of all, is this viable for me? Can I do this? Can I learn this quickly enough that I don't get bored because, uh, before I finish? Um, can I even afford the servers necessary? Because like servers are pretty cheap in Germany compared to other places, but they're still expensive. Um, then also I made the first infrastructure decisions. Which ingress controller should I use? Which Kubernetes disrupt, uh, distribution, dis disruption, that would be funny. Uh, no, <laughs> distribution should I set up? And also I wrote the first manifests, like deployment scripts. It's not scripts, but they uh, described my deployments. 
and I got my blog running inside my local cluster. Part two, the, the longest phase was uh, local VMs. So we just set up three different VMs um, on a local host, and I started writing Ansible playbooks. First of all, I had to learn what Ansible was. No, I, I knew what it is, but I didn't know how to use it. Um, then, as, so I wrote this ro uh, role for controller and worker nodes. I made even more infrastructure decisions. Uh, so, uh, which CRI, like um, basically which container runtime, like there's ContainerD, which is from Docker. Uh, they they used to be support for Docker directly, but it isn't supported anymore. And there's also CRIO, which is another one, or zero, I don't know, sorry. Um, so yeah, that was a decision I had to make. How am I going to do persistent storage? Because Kubernetes is great for stateless applications. Once you introduce state, it's a lot more difficult. And yeah, I had to have like a state for persistent storage. How do I automate a DNS search renewal? Uh, because I used um, traffic for that before, and while tra traffic is available for Kubernetes, the community ed edition is not very good, in my opinion. Um, and also, how am I going to do networking between my nodes? So, container network interface. Um, and I wrote a lot more manifests. Like, I already had my old infrastructure in... Uh, Docker Compose, and I basically just translated those Docker Compose uh, deployments manually to uh, Kubernetes manifests. There's a tool that can automate that, but I didn't want to use that. All right, so phase three, production deployment. I only had two servers at the time, so I needed a third one, because three servers is the minimum. Um, I reset two of my existing servers to become the worker nodes. I ran the same playbooks that I had already used locally. Then I debugged my persistent storage for an hour or so. Because, well, uh, partition labels do matter, even though you don't really see them that often. Success! Part four, ongoing maintenance, because IT projects are just never truly done. Um, First of all, deploying new apps, whatever stuff I wanted to to throw in there, um, improvising, uh, <laughs> improvising, improving monitoring, installing minor updates, uh, upgrading to a new Debian version because I, when I started it was still Debian 10, now we are on 11. And also I added Tailscale, which is like VPN but much cooler and less config. Uh, I hope that's a decent explanation. Well, I added that so I could uh, also add nodes at different providers because at this point uh, all of my container nodes were at the same server provider and I had a VLAN between them. Um, with Tailscale, hopefully at some point uh, I can also have nodes hosted at different providers so when one provider goes down, my infrastructure does not go down with it. That's not entirely com completed yet. Yeah. What part two? So what are the answers to all those questions I had? Um, first of all, storage. Uh, I decided that getting a whole second cluster just for storage wasn't going to be financially vi viable. So I used a Ceph cluster within Kubernetes managed by Rook. It's very resource hungry, like it's the most resource hungry uh, thing I've got. It's a bit difficult to debug, but it's super easy to use once it's up and running. I'm also planning uh, S3 storage based on MinIO. Ceph also comes with a S3, but I want MinIO for this uh, to back up my PVs because at this point I don't really have automated backups because every backup solution you can find for Kubernetes assumes you've got some S3 storage. And I don't at this point because S3 storage is expensive and yeah. And then I want to back up to my storage box, which hosts my different backups for other stuff uh, via bog backup. But that's not done yet. Network infrastructure. So um, 
I didn't use a CNI, I used a replacement tool that is really cool and not as resource hungry and I don't actually understand how it works, but it's great. <laughs> like, the person who wrote it is in this room, so it's really great. <laughs> um, it fits very, re really well into my initial VLAN setup. Um, and so yeah, that's good. I've also got Tailscale in addition to the VLAN for inner cluster communication. As I said, I'm currently building this up a bit more. I've also got Tailscale to run the uh, cube control command, so to tell my cluster what to do from my local device, I also connect via Tailscale. Um, I've got the Nginx ingress controller running, so that is the tool that um, decides where requests are going in. So if you enter one of my domains, which container is actually going to handle that request. And also like this, I think only one really viable option for TLS search creation and renewal, which is search manager. I procrastinated setting that up for a long time, even though it was super easy. Like it was the last thing I made before going pr to production. Monitoring and observability, observability <laughs> sorry. Uh, Prometheus uh, collects metrics and triggers alerts. I've got the, uh, an alert manager, which um, mes messages me via telegram, usually in the middle of the night, when something breaks. Uh, I've also got a Grafana that has super fancy dashboards that I barely ever use, but they look nice. Um, then I've got Loki, which uh, collects all of my logs to put them in one place. Um, and I've also got FICO, which monitors my, my kernel for potential security issues. So when someone hacks me, I hopefully find out pretty quickly. Continuous integration, another important part. Uh, I've got my projects all hosted on, a, on GitHub. I just need those tiny green squares that tell me I've, I done good. I even got more than a thousand contributions this year. Yay. Uh, well, um, container images are hosted on a Harbor instance in my cluster. Um, Harbor is a container registry that also does security check-in and a bunch of other cool stuff. I commits to the main branch of my blog, for example, trigger a build and push the container image via canary tag. Releases also build a new image and uh, tag that with the current version number. I used to have uh, drone CI to do that, but uh, it broke after I upgraded to Debian 11. And the stack I used with drone CI actually hadn't been updated in multiple years, so either write a whole new one or, um, or just switch to something else for now. Now I've got GitHub Actions, which um, is free to use, like 2,000 free minutes a, a month, that's enough for me. But also it goes down all the time. Like, if you've got an outage that you can fix yourself, that's okay. Like, yeah, I fucked up. But if GitHub has an outage and you can't do anything about it, that's much more frustrating. So yeah, I'm going to switch back to self-hosted CI at some point. What difficulties? did I encounter during this whole project? Yeah, storage should not work at the beginning. I forgot to set the correct tag on my partitions and uh, thought they didn't exist. Okay. Alert manager did not send any alerts after I restarted it. Well, stuff generally tends to uh, work better when you actually store the configuration and don't delete it after every restart. And then there's Helm. Like, basically a Kubernetes package manager. In my opinion, it's the Kubernetes equivalent of running a curl domain sudo bash. So, most people don't know what they're doing when they're deploying Helm charts, and honestly, I don't either in many cases, because those things are huge, and understanding them is just a lot of work. So it's always a bit tempting to just run this one command on their docs and suddenly it works. But it's much better to write your own manifests. And um, yeah, the only applications that I really had issues with on runtime were those that I deployed via Helm. So what did I learn? Because learning was like the main motivation for me. 
even complex looking architecture can uh, or infrastructure can become super easy if you take it one step at a time. Like I've had this layered approach where um, I would only do one thing and then I'd move on to the other and it just worked. It, it seemed easy to me. Also, always read the manifests, just as I said with, uh, with the Helm stuff. Um, because you have to understand what you're actually deploying uh, if you want to be able to debug it well. Better still, write them yourself. In many cases, it's possible they are probably going to be a lot shorter because they're for your infrastructure and not for every infrastructure that may be out there. Um, yeah, Monitoring is easy. Observability is hard. So I've got this Prometheus and it sends me an alert when something breaks, but it would be much better to know before something breaks. So that's why I got Loki and a bunch of different tools, but it's really hard to to know when something is going to be breaking. So that's an ongoing uh, project. Right now I'm basically mostly reactive in my monitoring. Also, uh, another thing um, during my uh, initial, initial setup, I ran into some things that were not uh, documented. So I just, uh, once I found out how they worked, I created a pull request and then it was accepted and people were thankful. So you don't have to understand the application correctly to make v v uh, valuable contributions to open source software. Another thing, issues don't show up even if they should. So maybe you've done something that broke an application, but for some reason it only crashes a week later and now you don't know why. Um, that happened a lot. And also another thing, even enterprise software can actually be very fun, which like many of us have probably written Java and don't think that's fun, but yeah, Kubernetes can be very fun. So now that I've walked you through it quickly, should you do that? Is this a good idea for you? Yeah, probably not. Unless you're, <laughs> unless you're similar to me, like this just doesn't make man much sense. Pros, it can be very fun. DevOps specialists are really well paid. The community is great. And also you can do zero downtime system upgrades, which I did when I upgraded to Debian 11. I had zero downtime for my important services, which is neat. Cons. Even if you go with low-cost V-servers, you're going to be paying 45 euros a month or more. Um, my cluster is not highly, availability at, uh, highly available at this point. I only have one control node. Um, so if I wanted to go uh, HA with that, that would be uh, two more servers at least, like 15 bucks each or something in that range. It's really expensive. You're also going to be uh, needing a lot of knowledge that's not going to be very useful for other things. So like, yeah, I'm a web developer, but uh, I'm also at a very small company, so we all basically can do anything um, if that is needed. So uh, the stuff I learned is also valuable for my work. But if I was a woodworker in my job, I probably wouldn't be using my Kubernetes uh, knowledge for anything. and my time would probably be better spent learning something else. And also another thing, you need to constantly keep an eye on security news to upgrade everything once it breaks, because you can very quickly uh, get attacked and breached, and you really don't want that, obviously. A secret additional point, tell us more about the memes. Jokes generally do not get funnier when explained, but an explained joke is still better than feeling like you don't belong because you don't understand the in-jokes. So I thought I'd explain some of those memes that got me into this whole thing. First of all, what is Kubernetes? There was this wonderful exchange on Twitter. That's actually, if you think long enough about it, that image is a good representation of what Kubernetes is. You just got to wrap your mind around it. <laughs> well. Kubernetes is just extremely difficult to explain. I hope I did a half decent job at doing so. Um, also, these logo clouds are everywhere and they do not help. 
And every damn blog post that tells you how to do something in Kubernetes has to explain what Kubernetes is for some reason, probably Zeo. It's annoying. Um, and those explanations usually are also pretty terrible. <laughs> then also we've got G's like on my shirt and generally honking. It doesn't really have much of a connection to Kubernetes in itself. It's just that the untitled Goose game was very popular among Kubernetes professionals. Goose are terrifying. Like, the, I was bit by two animals in my life, or three. One fish, that barely hurt. A dog, that also barely hurt. And a goose, and it hurt like hell. So, <laughs> geese are terrifying, but they're also cute. They're associated with mischief, and therefore also kind of hacking, because we're a mischievous bunch, at least a bit. Um, and it was just picked up by some very popular people, and everyone ran with it. Also, we've got the saying like that there's also outside of the Kubernetes uh, community, but very much inside it as well. Fuck around and find out. Does this count as a meme? I don't know, but it's my approach to learning something. Like, I just try doing it. It's going to break, but then I find out why it broke, and then I, I'll try again until I understand. So yeah, it's a very nice approach to doing things. Thank you for listening, and uh, I also like to end my talks by telling people to join a union, even though it doesn't really have anything to do here with anything here, but yeah. Thank you, this for Unicorn, for this really cool talk. We have a few minutes for Q&A, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will give you the microphone. Are you happy with Harbor? Yes, so far, very much. Uh, set, <coughs> uh, setting up a Kubernetes cluster, is it easy with uh, uh, the tools like Kubedium, Kubespray, or the Ansible playbooks? Means, uh, oh, wh what's your experience? Means, what you can suggest, maybe? So um, I mostly set up the uh, Kubernetes clusters using, uh, like I said, Ansible playbooks, and those Ansible playbooks run uh, kube ADM commands. Okay. So kube ADM makes it super easy to uh, administer, install, and uh, upgrade the cluster. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. So say I want to try this. How brutal do I have to get on my existing infrastructure? Do I have to wipe everything clean or get new servers? Or is there some way I can like play around on my existing stuff without wiping everything I have already? Well, that depends on what stuff you've got. Like, <laughs> like if you're just playing around, um, the documentation for Kubernetes actually has like some interactive things that let you set up a server that runs somewhere on a Google Cloud infrastructure for free while you're just figuring out how stuff works. That's a great first start. Then you can also just figure stuff out using Minikube or, or VMs. But if you're going to migrate, you're probably going to have to wipe everything and like restore from backups. So my blog posts are still online, but I had to do an SQL backup and play that in later. Thank you. Any more questions? Ah, yes. I imagine that you encountered some uh, so-called chicken and egg situations. Um, for example, how did you do uh, monitoring? Because I imagine that you host your monitoring solution inside your uh, Kubernetes uh, and if you might have an intruder, then maybe that's not that obvious because you could compromise your monitoring. Um, yes, that is true. And uh, the best practice would always be to host this stuff outside of Kubernetes. So like FICO, the security monitoring, that should be installed next to your cluster and not within your cluster. Uh, you can also... So uh, did... Do you host this uh, at your place at home on a Pi or similar, or what? What do you do with that uh, special part of your system? 
I do not follow best, best practices at all times. So <laughs> my stuff is not that interesting to hackers. I don't have that many compute resources to mine shitcoins. Um, so yeah, I do not have the resources. Uh, another thing you can do is like mirror your um, Prometheus, at least to another Prometheus. So if you've got a friend who's also running a cluster, you could kind of monitor your, yourself. Uh, <laughs> Yes, monitor in between, and at least when your Prometheus goes down, you will know. Okay. This looks like we don't have any more questions. Then another big round of applause to uh, this for a unicorn. <laughs>